Same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we just are privileged to gather together as a church family to uh, sing these songs and study these truths related to your birth and help them to resonate in our hearts this evening. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. How many of you have ever had a song that took you back to a certain era in your life? Uh, that's one of the beauty, beautiful things about Christmas and Christmas music. Uh, sometimes we sing a song and we connect that song to a memory, sometimes even a childhood memory. I read just recently of a phenomenon that's taking place right now called the vinyl revival. The vinyl revival. Maybe you've heard of this, and this is the, the reoccurrence of vinyl records. I don't know if you have a, a vinyl record player at home. Uh, I was born in the 80s, and so we had some vinyl records. And as some of my earliest childhood memories, uh, particularly Christmas songs, we, we had some records at our house. Uh, a few years back, my mom, uh, she dropped off uh, at my house uh, some things, some keepsakes, and, and included in these keepsakes were some of the records. The first one's not a Christmas record, but I thought it would be interesting to show you because it's one of the strangest things I've ever seen. Uh, Mary Sings. This is, this is the record, Mary Sings. And I think this was after my mom got saved, maybe. Uh, and this was a song about Jesus loves me. I say it's strange because Mary sings with a puppet here. You can't see it here. How many of you are just like, puppets are weird, right? So this was, uh, this was an album. And a lot of Christmas albums, though. Uh, a Canadian brass Christmas was one. Christmas organs and chimes. Uh, the, that Christmas feeling was another one. And then, uh, like we've heard tonight, just some, just some great heroes of the faith, some great hymn writers like George Strait and uh, also <laughs> Reba McIntyre. And if you're wondering if we like Reba's Christmas album, there's two of them, okay? So really some great songs, some Christmas songs, some biblical truths that are there. And I remember when she brought those over, how playing them brought back memories because I remember a Silent Night being sung on the record by Reba as a little, little kid. And there's, there's, there's some great songs there on that album. And it took me back to a, a time and a place. So this vinyl revival that's happening right now, uh, just back, back in 2017 for the first time ever, Sony reopened their record making, I don't know how they make vinyl records, but they, they opened it back up for the first time in 30 years because people are buying these vinyl records. Popular Mechanics this year uh, said part of the top 25 gifts to give to your parents is a vinyl record player. Maybe I should re-gift these and give them back to you, mom. <laughs> There's something special about Christmas songs. They take us back to uh, a previous time, but they take us back more than that to powerful truths. And I don't know if you were singing and thinking through, and I think that's one of the most important things we can do as we sing in church is to ponder the words that we sing. And there's some rich truths in the Christmas songs, even the songs that we sing tonight. Well, tonight we're going to go back to this, the very first songs. The songs that are sung by the angels. And in the next few minutes, I just wanted you to very simply consider with me from this passage uh, the heavenly choir, the chorus, and the king. The choir, the chorus, and the king. Real quick, I know we were here this morning, but let's start with some context. In verse number 8, And there were the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. There's a few things that are good to know about shepherds, just some historical context. Shepherds were despised. People didn't like shepherds. Uh, they were unclean. They were outcast because of their schedule, because of their sanitation. They couldn't uh, participate in any ceremonial laws or any, any duties. They could not enter into the temple courts. They were unclean. They were outcast. Uh, they were untrustworthy. It was just common knowledge. You didn't buy anything 
from a shepherd. Shepherd. Side note, there's a distinction in Scripture between a hireling and a shepherd, and Jesus is the good shepherd, right? So there is a good shepherd. But, but as society would look at shepherds, often they would look down on shepherds. They were untrustworthy, and they were uneducated. They weren't tracking the latest theological trends. They didn't know what was, what was up and what was happening. So they were despised, and, and they were there to watch sheep. I found a video of a man who has a, 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 a trail camera that he's got fixed on his sheep to keep an eye on them at night. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I'll, I'll play it for you. Pretty fascinating, huh? That's it. That's, that's what shepherds do all, all night long, right? Sheep, when it's dark, they don't have very good vision. When it's dark, they will talk like that to each other. They want to know where their family is. Their mom's keeping track of kids. And so they'll, they'll ask. And sometimes the shepherd will herd the sheep together and put them in a pen. And then the shepherd will sleep at the door of the pen. That's why Jesus said, I am the door, right? And so uh, the sheep, these shepherds had a pretty mundane existence. This is all they would do. They would do it at night. And so this is the setting for the arrival of Christ. And so these, these sheep, these shepherds are there. And then, then comes the choir, heaven's choir. Look at verse number nine. We see the words, and lo, and lo. Maybe you've used the phrase before, lo and behold. What are we doing? We're signaling that something happened. Something was ordinary or something was simple or something was expected. And then lo and behold, now it's unexpected. Now it's extraordinary. And so here they are, uh, the, choir, the, the, the angels appear, and lo and behold, about 10 years ago in Nordstrom, there was a choir, it was the Los Angeles Master Choir, uh, had arranged to go to a Nordstrom rack in, uh, here in the Los Angeles area, and the choir was, was not in their usual setting, they just entered into the mall, and without telling anyone, all at once they sang uh, Handel's Messiah. And it was a treat for everyone that was there to hear a choir of that caliber, a kind of a, a flash mob uh, singing. And uh, everyone enjoyed it, right? And so they were, and lo, they were there suddenly. But, but the choir we see here in just a moment is much greater than that. They didn't just appear in a mall. And so this moment, even though this moment was unexpected, we have to remember that this moment was not unplanned, right? Genesis chapter number three, verse number 15, we read of the first gospel and we read, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his hill. It's this first glimpse of the gospel, the first glimpse that there would be a coming savior, that there would be a Messiah, uh, uh, an offspring from, from Eve. And so Eve has children, it's Cain and Abel. And then uh, Cain kills Abel, so that's probably not them, right? And then we keep moving. Then we got Noah, he's a preacher of righteousness. Maybe it'll be him, and it's not him. And then you keep reading through Abraham. And uh, even in uh, Genesis chapter number 22, there's another foreshadow of Christ coming. It's not Abraham, it's someone else. He's coming. Moses, same thing we read of uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, and him ye shall hearken. And then to David, uh, uh, he is told, I will set up thy seed after thee. I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so we find these little glimpses and traces, these foreshadows of this moment. And now in the quiet field, the time has come. Galatians 4, 4 said, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So verse number nine again, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. So the, the choir is coming, but a solo first, an individual angel appears. Now angels play an important part of the Christmas story. God uses angels uh, to convey uh, messages. In fact, the word angel means messenger. And we've already seen several appearances from angels. And, and the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and then Mary and then to Joseph. And we're not given the name of this particular angel, but uh, given Gabriel's connection to messianic announcements, it may be G Gabriel here once again uh, communicating to the shepherds the arrival of Jesus. 
There's two noteworthy observations in this passage. The first is that angels are glorious. Angels are glory. The glory shone round about them, the Bible says. And the response from the shepherds were that they were sore afraid. They were glorious. Uh, we have sometimes an idea in our minds of what an angel might look like. Uh, Ezekiel maybe gives us another idea, and it's a little bit scary, to be honest. And maybe that's why the response was fear. And so the angels, are the, it's not expected. They appear, and lo, here's the angel of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord shines round about them. They're sore afraid. And there were numerous. In verse number 13, we read, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts. That word subtly, Luke uses it again in the book of Acts to describe uh, the light that shone down suddenly uh, from, Dema- uh, from heaven near Damascus. And so this light is sudden, the appearance of the angels, it's low and behold, now it's suddenly, this is a startling uh, night. Talk about a contrast between the quiet, calm night. Now all, all is bright, right? And how many angels are there, are there here? Well, we don't exactly know, but there's, there's an army of angels. That's what a host is. It's an army of angels. In the book of Revelation, John wrote concerning the angels, and he said that, I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Sometimes my daughter Quinn, when she's counting and she wants to make up a really big number, she'll just make up numbers. That, that's what it, this sounds like to me. It's, it's a lot. It's 10,000 times 10,000 plus thousands and thousands. There's a lot of angels here. And here's this heavenly host. And one of the things that's important to note about the heavenly host is who's in control of the heavenly host. And that's the Lord of hosts. This is, G, this is God. Uh, great countless angels under his command. And lo, and suddenly there's the choir. But let's look at the chorus. What do they come? What message do they communicate? What message are they giving? What is the message of Christmas? Well, we saw this morning that, first of all, uh, the, the comfort of the message. There was, there was comfort in the message. And the angel said unto them, fear not, fear not. Have you ever been out knocking on someone's door and you came across someone that's maybe doing some yard work? Maybe they got some AirPods in. Maybe they're, they're blowing a leaf blower and you're, and you're coming up behind them and you know you're going to startle them. You ever know that's going to happen before? Like, I don't want to, but I know I'm going to startle this person. So you always, you always, anytime you have an interaction like that, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. That is every interaction from an angel. That's how every conversation with an angel starts. We read of it here. We've read of it already throughout the Christmas story. Fear not. Like, like that's how the conversation begins. The angels are used to that. Fear not, right? And so this is the message from the angels. Fear not. Now, this is the, the most repeated uh, command in Scripture, fear not. And it comes in different shapes and forms. Fear not. Let not your heart be troubled. Uh, he, peace I will give you, uh, Jesus said. And so fear not, but that, that, that reason for fear was given. There's a command to fear not, but then there's a reason, right? If I'm fearful and you tell me to not be fearful, I want to know why. You better give me a good reason or I'm going to keep being fearful. So they, they give that command, that, that calm, that comfort to fear not, but they very quickly attach it to the good news. And that's what the angel says, fear not. For behold, I bring you the good tidings of great joy, connecting the, the, the command, the, the comfort, right, to the gospel. And by the way, for us, that is the comfort that we have in this world. We may not have, and we, we enjoy so many comforts as Americans, but the, the comfort that we have and that we find is, that is promised us is found in the gospel. It's found in the good news. And so there's comfort in the message, but then there's, there's clarity in the message. Look at verse number 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. There is no confusion in this message. By the way, just from a historical perspective here, there's a time, there's a place, there's a location, right, that is given. And here, here's the time and the event when this historical of event occurred. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. What a spectacular birth announcement. Uh, there was another trend that started back in 2008. Maybe you're aware of this. There was a Los Angeles-based blogger that decided to take to social media uh, to announce to her family and all of social media watching 
of her new baby's gender. It was called the gender reveal. Would it be a boy or would it be a girl? Well, the video went viral, garnering over 13 million views very quickly. And it started a new trend of baby gender reveals. Even this past year and the past several years, because of baby reveal uh, parties, there have literally been earthquakes triggered. You can read about that in New Hampshire. You say, how do you trigger an earthquake? It was 80 pounds of explosives, right, at this gender reveal party. Uh, there have been airplane crashes. There's been tragedy. There'd be people that have died from these gender reveal. And some of them are funny and some of them are pretty spectacular. The person who started it, Jenna here, said, I, I had no idea of the trend. Uh, I wish I'd never started the ridiculous gender party reveal trend. Now, their trend. Now, there's some wild baby announcements, right? But nothing compares to the announcement of this night. A host of angel, an army of angels to shepherd. And that brings me here to the contrast of the message. So there's, there's, there's a calming aspect. Fear not. Why? Because of the good news I'm about to give you. That Christ, the Savior, is born. So there's a calming aspect. There's clarity in the message. But look at the contrast. In verse number 12, And this shall be a sign unto you, that ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. James, in chapter number two, wrote, Hath not God chosen the poor of, of, this, of, the poor of this world rich in faith? And so here, God chooses and selects and according to his sovereign plan, brings his announcement of his son into the world to lowly shepherds. There's a contrast there, right? When you think of, and, and, and Caesar, we're going to talk about Caesar in just a minute. He's a big deal, right? There are kings and dominions and kingdoms that are established and set up. And then, and then you look at the contrast to how Jesus came and the humility in which he clothed himself, even at his very arrival there's a contrast here that must not be mistaken. Because of the shepherd's proximity to Jerusalem, many believe, and it's definitely possible, that the sheep that were being raised here were being raised specifically to be provided as a sin offering. A sin, sin required a covering, and those lambs, one by one, would provide a temporary covering. But Hebrews said, but, I, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. Who is that man? It's the baby in the manger. It's Jesus. And here Jesus came and, 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 and not to the pomp and circumstance that maybe we, we would expect or even some of the, the announcements uh, that, that we've seen, but yet he came and he came in humility. And, and who is the announcement given to? To the lowest possible segment of society that God instructs his angels to give the highest possible theological truth. It's the highest truth given to the lowliest people. Plain speech to plain men to convey deep truths. By the way, we should do the same. We should be faithful in telling others, just clearly, clearly giving the gospel, the plain truths, the deep truths, but the plain truths. And this is the backdrop for the glory of of God. This is what God chooses and selects on that silent night. This is how his son Jesus enters into the world, the backdrop for his glory. But notice finally with me, there's heaven's choir, there's heaven's chorus, the message. But notice finally with me, heaven's king, heaven's king. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. A few moments ago, we read the words good tidings or good news. It's where we literally get the word gospel. It means good news. And what is this good news? The good news is that Jesus had been born, the Savior of the world. But there was another gospel at the time, and that was the gospel of Rome. We heard of this a little this morning as well. And the gospel of Rome preached that Caesar Augustus was the Savior of the world. Rome had its own gospel. By the way, there will always be counterfeit gospels. There will always be counterfeit gospels. 
And so, and, and such was the case. Rome had their own gospel, and it was, a, it was a contradictory message to the message that the angels brought. And I think there was intention for that, and I think there's reason, good reason for that, that the angels' message directly contradicted the world's message. So according to Caesar, according to uh, Caesar Augustus, according to Rome, Caesar Augustus was the Son of God. I think we've got a, uh, a coin here that shows on the back of it, lit, written in Latin, that Caesar is the son of God. Uh, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus' father, would have been considered a deity. So Julius, or so Caesar Augustus was considered the son of God. There was found in uh, modern Turkey a, a calendar. And in the calendar, there's a description. I think we have a, a picture of it. This is housed in Frankfurt in a museum in Frankfurt, Germany. And in Frankfurt, uh, if you read through this inscription, it, it attributes deity uh, to Caesar. It calls him the son of God. It calls him, uh, uh, attributes uh, divinity to him and says he is literally uses the word savior. And so when the angel comes, the message that the angels bring, the message that God gives them to communicate runs in direct contra uh, contradiction to the message of the world. See, the message of the angels, uh, God's proclamation is that Jesus reigns, not Caesar. Jesus reigns. Jesus saves, not Caesar. Only Jesus can give peace. Again, Rome is in this time of Pax Romana. They've been experiencing that peace, but that peace would be short-lived. Only Jesus can bring peace. See, Rome would end. Caesar would die. But of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. What a truly beautiful aspect of Christmas. Yes, the angels. I mean, it's beautiful. It's captivating. It's mesmerizing to think, what, what do they look like and how do they sound and what was that? But let me tell you the most spectacular, logic-defying, hope-delivering piece of the entire Christmas story was lying in the manger. God in the flesh. Heaven's choir came down to sing when heaven's king came down to save. The heavens declare the glory of God. The Bible tells us, us, uh, tells, uh, tells us this in the Old Testament. that the, the heavens declare the glory of God. And we can live for the glory of God. We can live in a way that brings God glory. But there's no greater glory than God in the flesh. In C.S. Lewis' book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the story begins when four siblings tumble through an old wardrobe into the enchanted world of Narnia. But Narnia is in bondage, held captive for a hundred years by the magic of the evil white witch. And while under her rule, it's always winter but never Christmas. No life can grow. Uh, loved ones are turned to stone. And everyone in Narnia lives in fear, robbed of all joy and peace. Once, uh, the, and now the once beautiful land of Narnia has become a place of defeat and despair. In the line, the witch in the wardrobe, there is only one thing that can break the, witch, the white witch's curse. And that's the great line, the true king of Narnia, Aslan. And Aslan has not been seen in Narnia for many years. In fact, he hasn't been sighted in living memory still. All of Narnia hopes, lives in hope of the prophecy of his return. And that prophecy of Aslan, the king, state, was stated such as this. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes into sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bares his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. And it was on this quiet night, this calm night, where the shepherds were on a hillside, unexpecting, that the great king of the universe came to be with us. To make wrongs right to give us the opportunity to have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. And in this moment, Jesus, uh, through Jesus, Satan is about to be bruised. Liberty will be proclaimed to the captives. Sight will be given to the blind. Jesus was no longer just seen through types and figures, although they are beautiful and instructive. Now, face to face, lying in a manger. Luke, uh, uh, John chapter number one describes it this way. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So how should we respond? How should we respond to God's glory? If you know Jesus, you've seen his glory, and we beheld his glory. 
So how should we respond to the glory of Christmas? There's, and we're done. There's a, there's a few responses. First of all, the glory of God, the glory of Christmas should captivate us. It should captivate us. Here the shepherds are. They're in their field. And the Bible tells us that they're, they're watching. And lo, the word lo means, uh, it's, it means look, right? So they go from watching something to paying attention to, to something they can't turn their attention away from. And the truths of Christmas should captivate our hearts. And sometimes they become so familiar, repeated so many times throughout the years, that it's just a truth that we've heard before. Maybe, maybe tonight your heart, once again, is captivated by the truth, the message of Christmas. The, the, the glory of Christmas should captivate our hearts. Amen. Give your attention to the truths that we've uh, considered tonight. Consider them again throughout this season and throughout the year. They should captivate our hearts. How should we respond? It should captivate us. But also it should eliminate. Well, what does it eliminate? We already spoke of this. It eliminates fears. But it also, the, the, the appearance of the angel, the, the host of angels, it dispelled the darkness, right? And this is a, a metaphor that is used throughout Scripture. In fact, John said, in him was light. And this is the light of the world, right? And as you see the light, darkness goes away. They can't coexist. You can't turn on. When you turn on the light, you turn off the darkness, right? And so it should captivate us, but also the glory of God as we, as we consider his glory and live for his glory, it should captivate our hearts and our attention. It's the only thing worthy. And it should eliminate fears, and yes, and eliminate uh, darkness as well. And then it should activate. It should captivate, it should eliminate, and it should activate. What should it activate in our hearts? What should the glory of Christmas, and we read of it here just a moment ago, the, the glory shown round about them, it should activate worship. The Christmas uh, message of this passage, J.C. Ryle said, should make us to sing year-round. The substance of the angel's song is instructed, instructive. The angels, they, they bring this perspective. They sing glory to God in the highest. I think it's interesting that the perspective that the angels bring, right? Here are, here's the angels who do not need to be redeemed, who, who are not fallen. And they've got this front row seat to what? To the, to the fall of man, to the misery of sin, but also to the blessedness of heaven. They've got a perspective here. And what is, their, what is their perspective? What response do they have to this unfolding plan of God? They're joyful and they're, they're worshiping and they, and they bring glory to God. That's the only appropriate response to Christmas is, is to worship. Perhaps it's time for some of us again to, to join the choir. Uh, and I'm not speaking of just the physical choir here, although Brother Williams would probably appreciate that. Talk to him if you'd like to join the choir. But we ought to adopt the perspective of the angels, of the misery of sin, but the goodness of God and the blessed hope that we have in heaven. Why? Because we've, we've beheld his glory. It should change us. Then it should lead to obedience. It should activate in our hearts obedience. We see the angels are there under the obedient command of the Lord of hosts. And they give a charge to the shepherds. They said, this will be a sign. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And we read that it came to pass after the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go now unto Bethlehem and see the thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And it says that they came with haste. And so they take the commands, they, 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 they obey with haste, the Bible tells us. So the wonder of Christmas, the glory of Christmas should elicit in our hearts worship and obedience. And when they go, verse number 16 says, they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. They found exactly what they had been told. Their simple faith had yielded rich reward. And then the fin finally, what should, what should it, what response to those others? There's uh, worship, there's obedience, and then there's peace. This is the response that we have from Christmas. The peace of God in our hearts. Think of this verse. It's so familiar to us, but glory to God in the highest. That is an upward response that should be true in every single one of our lives, not just in Christmas, but every single day. An upward response. 
worship. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. This is an inward realization that we can be at peace with God because of the baby in the manger. And then there's an outward response. Goodwill towards men. Let's go tell it on the mountaintops that Jesus Christ is born.